Praise God. Now, we want to read this morning. We're in the New Testament. We're over in the Acts of the Apostles, and we're cutting into chapter 7. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. We're going to cut into that chapter down in verse 54. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, and it's verse 54. We're continuing our series, of course. We've looked at uh, various uh, things in connection with the days in which we're living. We have worked our way through worship. We've looked a little at it. We looked at the Word of God. We looked at your will. We thought about that last week. And today we're thinking about witness. All things that are so important in these days of time. And if you have the worship, and if you have the Word of God, and if you have the will surrendered to the Word of God, then praise God we look at this we will be strong witnesses in these days for our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 54, Stephen, of course, has been speaking, and it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold... I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And we just as always trust that the Lord's blessing will be upon his own truth for his name's sake. Friends, today we're thinking about witness as I've said, I've run through a number of W's. We've had worship, we've had the word, we've had your will. We've spent two or three weeks on nearly each one of these. We spent one week on the will uh, last week, just the one week. And today we're thinking about witness. And you know, we're thinking about standing alone in that witness. We're living in days when, you know, I've said this over these past number of weeks especially trying to remind and encourage the young people in particular that we're living in desperate days. We're living in days when who knows what may happen. And in many ways, we have been very privileged in this nation to have enjoyed, how would you put it, um, a relative protection, so to speak, by the church and by the influence of the church in the nation. But we are living, you don't need me to tell you this, we're living in days when things change so quickly. And who knows really what may happen in this nation in the coming days that lie before us. Here we have a man who stands alone as a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And praise God for the power that we have whenever we stand together. The Bible says, one will chase a thousand. Uh, Ten will chase ten, sorry, two will chase ten thousand. Thank God for the power we have whenever we are with one another. But there are times, and there will be times when we are all by ourselves, so to speak, standing as a testimony, standing as a witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whenever you don't have your brothers, whenever you don't have your sisters in Christ around you, times whenever you will have to stand alone. Times whenever perhaps in your workplace, you're the one who is against the crowd. Maybe some of you young people, times in school, whenever you're the one who's standing against the peer pressure of the rest of your, your fellow students that are in your form or in your class. And friends, it happens in school life. It happens in the workplace. It can happen in the street. It can happen even in our own families. Whenever you or I may be the only Christian voice in a particular situation that stands against whatever it is. The voice that speaks out against immorality. The voice that speaks out against pornography. The voice that speaks out against all sorts of things that are happening in the world around us today. 
How do we be good witnesses? How do we be faithful? How do we be strong witnesses in those particular times? We live in an age, as we said earlier, over previous weeks, more and more we see the spirit of Antichrist at work in society around us, working in the government, working in various governmental departments. As we've said, things are changing. We need to stand and be witnesses for Almighty God. The Bible says that we are to stand. And as we get closer to the coming, I'll probably finish this. Val, Val will be here, God willing, next weekend, the weekend after. I'll probably finish this series. We'll be thinking about the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because those are the days that we are living in. I believe many of us, many especially perhaps in the younger generation, may well see the coming of our Lord, be alive whenever the coming of our Lord uh, happens, whenever that great event takes place. Who knows? But we'll be thinking about that, God willing, in a fortnight's time. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are to take the whole armor of God. And it says, having done all, we're to stand, therefore, and we're to take the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Friends, our job, our duty, our privilege is to stand for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the great need in the days in which we live to be able to stand, to be able to stand fast. Here in Acts chapter 7, we have the story, of course, of Stephen, as we've already mentioned. The name Stephen means crown. And what a man he was. He was one of the, the first deacons that were chosen into the early church. The Bible says he was a man who was full of the Holy Ghost and of power. And he spoke to, to these or to those in this chapter, the high priest, you know, the, the scribes, the elders, the various ones, and, and, and they could not resist his message, packed with spiritual dynamite, if you want to call it that. Packed with spiritual insight and packed with spiritual power. He was a layman. He was not some kind of qualified preacher, just a layman, a deacon. But a man who was full of power, and the Bible tells us that God performed miracles through this man, Stephen. He appears on the scene. He's not mentioned in the earlier chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. He was one of the Grecian believers. He was a half, so to speak. And yet he was a man chosen, full of the Holy Ghost and power, used mightily by God. And he was a man who was well beyond many of the others who were in the church at that particular time. A man of tremendous understanding. In fact, Stephen was perhaps a man who understood many things about the history of Israel that the apostles didn't understand fully at this particular time. A tremendous character full of the Holy Ghost and full of power. Just a layman, as I've said, just a deacon, but full of the power of God. And the power with which he spoke caused these, it says, to gnash and to snarl against him and to rush upon him to take his life. Verse 54, where we picked up the reading, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Friends, we've said before, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And we know this story. We know this story. But for Stephen, let's put ourselves for just a moment in his situation. And he's standing alone against the, the animosity, against the opposition of the crowd that he has to face. It was his time, his time to stand fast. And I believe that he was able to do that because verse 55 tells us he was a man full of the Holy Ghost. A man full. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, they gnash at him. They rush upon him. 
But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly to heaven. You see, Stephen dies for the faith. Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. And this morning, I want us to to, to focus on how he was able to do this. How he was able to witness in such a tremendous way in the face of the opposition that was against him. You see, this was the first time that martyrdom had happened. First time that had happened. We have people martyred practically every single day across the world for their faith today. But up to this time, the church had flourished. Up to this time, the church was really moving and the Spirit of God still did after he was martyred. But this was the first occasion whenever martyrdom, whenever someone would literally lay down their life, lay down their all as a witness to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The believers knew nothing of anyone dying for what they believed. You know, we're the same in this country. In some parts of the world where people can be martyred for their faith, they would know much more about this than what we would hear. We hear about it. It happens on distant shores. It touches our hearts. But friends, really, do we, do we really feel the pain of that? Do we really enter into that with fellow believers the way they do in all our shores and in all our countries. And so it's profitable for us this morning to look at this and consider this so that we can learn how to be properly prepared for what we face in the inevitability of having to face this kind of thing in the days that lie ahead. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost. You know, it tells us that about Stephen more than once. Back in chapter 6 of the Acts of the Apostles, Whenever they go to select the first deacons, that's the requirement. Acts chapter 6, it says in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. There was a problem, and this was going to be the solution for that problem. Men, pick out men full of the Holy Ghost. Listen to verse 5 of chapter 6. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, here we are again, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Mentioned there again, a man full of the Holy Ghost. Three times it tells us that truth. It's as if I believe the Holy Spirit's trying to sell it tell us something very special about this man and about the situation that he's going to find himself in. But I believe that's the first requirement for being able to stand as a witness against this kind of opposition that may well come our direction, being full of the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to be full of the Holy Ghost? What does it really mean? Friends, it means to be full of God. And that poses a question for all of us today. Are we full of God? You see, any one of us who professes to be saved, any one of us who knows the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Some of the idea, of course, that this is for some believers... If you're a preacher, if you're an evangelist, if you're a missionary, if you're a prophet, this is just for those particular class. And I don't mean class on a level. I mean a group of people that God uses. But in Ephesians 5 and 18, and you know this verse so well, Paul writes to believers in Ephesus. And Paul says to all the believers, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's not just for the preacher, and it's not just for the evangelist, and it's not just for the missionary, it's not just for the elder, it's not just for the deacon. Friends, it's for all in the body of Christ. That's what Paul's writing, and that's what he's writing too. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, whenever Peter is preaching, 
And the Holy Ghost has come upon them there on the day of Pentecost. And, and Peter says, this promise is unto you and unto your children. And to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled. I wonder in your life, are you seeking to walk full of the Holy Spirit? Are you seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And friends, please understand my heart. I am not talking about having some experience of speaking in tongues. Although I believe certainly that's a sign. But there's much more to a life full of the Spirit than Pentecostal phenomena, whatever they might be. There's a walk in the Spirit that all of us need to have that all of us need to be searching God for, that all of us need to be pursuing a walk after God. And we all can go through times in our lives whenever you know, we're, we're seeking after God, trying to do those things, but we'd have to confess that we are not full of the Holy Spirit at those particular times. If you're like me, you come and go. Do you ever do that? You have better times than others. No, nobody does that. No, no, just me. That's okay. That's all right. But that's just what happens. And you know... He comes, he touches our lives. You see, if you are saved today, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you as a resident. He lives in your life. Whenever you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he becomes president. And friends, there's a great difference. A great difference from being saved and being filled. A great difference from knowing that the Holy Spirit has come into your life and knowing that the Holy Spirit is Lord of your life, leading your life, guiding your life. That he's not just living in you, but he reigns and he rules and he takes control. He doesn't just reside. He doesn't just abide, but he presides. He's in control of your life. And you see, it's one thing to have the Holy Spirit. I've said this before. It's quite something else for the Holy Spirit to have you and for the Holy Spirit to have me. And Paul says we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that's the first requirement, the standing alone, to be able to witness as this brother did all those years ago in the face of that kind of animosity, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The other requirements... I believe, follow on after that. Because we also need to be filled with wisdom to speak for Christ. If you want to look back in your Bible to verse 10 of chapter 6, verse 10 says this, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. Now here's the question again. Do you and I have that? You see, in this chapter, chapter 7, Stephen gives a tremendous message. And for all intents and purposes, you can read your way through the message that, that Stephen presented to them on this occasion. And it looks like a history of their nation, a history of Israel, from Abraham's call there in Ur of the Chaldees. And he touches on Moses, touches on Joseph, he touches on Moses, he touches on various people as he gives a history of the nation. But Stephen had tremendous wisdom in what he said to them. Because the message wasn't just a review of the nation. It doesn't, wasn't just a review of Bible history. You see, anyone can memorize the facts of the Bible. That's not what the message was about. His message was filled with wisdom. Because he was speaking to people who were protecting Judaism. He was speaking to people who were holding on to that old covenant in spite of what Jesus had done. And you'll see if you work your way through what Stephen shared with them, you know, they, everything they did revolved around their temple and the old ways of doing things. And yet here's Stephen telling them that God spoke to Abraham whenever he wasn't in Israel, whenever there was no temple. He says exactly the same thing about Moses. God spoke to Moses on the backside of the mountain through the burning bush. He wasn't in Israel at that time. There was no temple. And he goes through various things like that as he shares with them, trying to show them that God is a God who can touch people as and when and wherever he wants. Amen. 
And that's what he has done. And he works his way through this as he shares that history, if you like, with them. But he works his way through it with tremendous wisdom. Tremendous wisdom. He had unusual, supernatural wisdom. As I've said, he was a Grecian, but I believe he was way before his time. Probably one of the best believers that Jesus had at that particular time in the church, apart from the apostles. In Luke chapter 21 and 12, Jesus told disciples, they will lay their hands on you, they will arrest you, they will persecute you. And in verse 13, Jesus says, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. A testimony. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, whenever they do that, this is going to be your big opportunity to talk about me. And that's what Stephen is doing on this occasion. Mr. Normal Christian, you are going to have a chance to speak for Jesus. Mr. Normal Christian, you are going to have a chance to preach a message for the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever you are called to stand in the face of whatever that is, whether it be at work, school, wherever it might be, that will be your opportunity to stand as a witness for the Lord. And friends, I wonder today, really, if that happened to us, How would we work with that? Are we well enough equipped to deal with that? If you or I were lifted and they said to you or they said to me, deny Christ or, you're sitting there saying that will never never happen in this country. Don't you bet on that. But if that were to happen, what would you do? What would you say Would you, would I, would we be able to stand as the witnesses that Jesus wants to be, wants us to be? In Luke chapter 21, verse 14, Jesus said, Settle it therefore in your heart not to meditate before what you should answer. Don't go to bed thinking about it. Jesus said, forget about it. Settle it in your heart not to worry about it. Verse 15, he gives a promise. He says, for I will give you a mouth and I will give you wisdom. You see, friends, praise God today. He has promised that whenever we walk with him, listen to me, please, whenever the worship's as it should be, whenever the word of God has its place in our hearts as it should have, whenever our will is being transformed by the will of God, Jesus says whenever the time of solo witness, if you want to call it that, whenever that time of witness comes your way, Jesus says, I'll give you a mouth. And I'll give you wisdom. Because the worship, the word, and the will all allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power and with his presence. And you see, that's what this is all about. What Jesus said was fulfilled right here in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen. And friends, we are living in days when you and I may get opportunity to speak for Jesus like this sooner than we care to think. Because that's the world that we live in. And you're not going to have time to prepare. But Jesus can and Jesus will give you what you are to say and how to say it if you are full of the Holy Ghost with a life that's surrendered to him in that way. Because we will need wisdom, wisdom, which only he can give. Listen to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. It says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. There are times whenever you and I are called to stand alone for Jesus. And what you say, if it's said in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, can touch even a hostile heart that's there. You see, Saul was here on this occasion. Breathing out venom against the church. Murdering threats. But you see, Saul is about to be touched by the Spirit of God. And I believe Stephen had a tremendous part to play in that. Because I think if you check back through Saul's history, you will find that because of who Stephen was, Saul had probably encountered Stephen in some of the synagogues before, if you read back through the Acts of the Apostles. 
Saul had probably encountered Stephen before, and this is just another time whenever a Holy Ghost anointed witness touches Saul's life. And of course, we know eventually he goes to Damascus and he meets with the Lord Jesus Christ along the road. Praise God. How would we fare in this kind of situation? We need to be people filled with the Holy Ghost. We need to be people who are endued with, with wisdom. And who knows when we may be called to stand like this against this kind of hostility in the nation around us in the days that lie ahead. Oh, they may not like sometimes what we say to them. Have you ever witnessed to somebody, you know, and they, they have you? and never get cross with you? Nobody ever does that, should they don't. Sometimes they do, folks, and you know that as well as I do. They just get cross. And they're cross at Stephen here. They gnash on him. They rush upon him. They take him out of the city. The Bible says they stole him to death. They may not like it, but God the Holy Spirit knows what he wants to do, and he inspires, and who knows what life he can touch. You see, it's like salt in a cut to them here in Acts 7. They get angry. They got agitated, and they stoned him. But let me say again, but Saul was there. And the Holy Spirit gives Stephen wisdom to speak well for Jesus so that he could use it for the glory of his name. So we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. We need wisdom to speak very, very quickly. We also need to be full of power to stand. It says in verse 51 of chapter 7, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, do you... You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. He goes at them. There's power in his witness. Great power. And then he continues, and we picked up the reading there in verse 54. Can you imagine him saying that to those people of influence? Can you imagine him saying that to those people of authority in his nation? The people that he was saying that to were the movers and were the shakers of Israel at that time. Yet he speaks with power. He speaks with tremendous courage because he has power to stand for Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Did he have a lot of courage naturally? Friends, I believe he was just like you. I believe he was just like me. Who likes the idea of being persecuted? Who likes the idea of being put to death? Persecuted even to death for the faith. Who likes the idea of falling into the hands of those who hate them, that they might kill him, that they might stone him? Yet here's a man, a believer, a brother, who shows tremendous courage. I think I've told you before, you know what courage is, don't you? You know what courage is? Courage is fear. Fear that has said its prayers. Courage is fear, but the person is completely in touch with Almighty God. Courage is fear that through prayer has brought the presence and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and power into that individual's life. That's what courage is. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is the mastery of fear through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the presence and by the power of his spirit. And here's a man who has no fear of telling the truth. <laughs> two, two, men, two, men appeared, two men appeared in court and one had beaten up the other. And whenever they're, they're standing there in court, the judge asked the victim, he says, could you describe the man who beat you up? And you see, the judge was trying to determine what the assailant was really like. Could you describe the man who beat you up? No, Your Honor, he says, I don't want to describe him because he says, that's what I was trying to do whenever he hit me. <laughs> but friends, that's what fear, that's what courage is. You know, and sometimes truth isn't received easily. Stephen said here, you're stiff-necked. He says, you're uncircumcised in heart. You resist the Holy Ghost just as your father did. But he's standing fast for Christ. He's standing against the spirit of Antichrist. He's standing against everything that would oppose the kingdom of Christ. 
And he's standing fast and he has power to stand because, again, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have fear, you will fold up whenever the Lord asks you to stand up. And so we need to make sure we're well prayed. We need to make sure we're well committed and surrendered to the Lord God. Pray, seek God, be full of the Holy Spirit, and you will overcome fear with his power. So he had wisdom to speak for Christ. He had power to stand for Christ. Let me finish very quickly. Lastly, he had faith to suffer for Christ. Faith to suffer for Christ. Acts 6 verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You see, friends, we need faith to suffer for Christ. You know, we're taught today in the church that if you have the right faith, you're never going to be in trouble. If you, if you have the right faith, you're never going to be in debt. If you have the right faith, you're never going to be in any of those things. But friends, listen to me, please. Faith doesn't get you out of difficulty. Sometimes your faith will get you into difficulty. That's what faith does. Jesus, Jesus didn't come to get you out of trouble. But no, praise God, he comes to be in the trouble with you. Amen. And you see, that's what makes all the difference. He draws near. The Spirit of God enables. The Spirit of God empowers. The Spirit of God anoints. The Spirit of God fills. And Jesus is with you right there in the midst of that. And please get this. Faith will not keep you from suffering, but faith will enable you to suffer. Stephen suffered, died, calling upon God. Lay not this sin to their charge. Here's his faith. He looked up and he knew he knew that he had seen the Lord. He understood, friends, listen, that there's more to life than this world. He understood that there's more to life even than the opposition that he as a Christian was facing with these ungodly people. He understood that, praise God, he had a glorious future. Do you know today, you and I, we have a glorious future? Amen. You can get enthusiastic about that. Because praise God, what a day that's going to be. Hey, whenever we see Jesus, whenever I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, what a day, what a glorious day that's going to be. And whatever we're called to, to, to put up with, whatever we're called to endure, whatever we're called to pass through on this scene of time, the Bible says God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. The tears of pain, the tears of sorrow, the tears of sadness. Listen, even the tears of feeling him. Because we'll be in his presence. The presence of the one who doesn't just love us, but the presence of the one, praise God, who is love. Whose love envelops us. Whose love draws us to him. Whose love, praise God, will make us a part of him for all of eternity. Amen. I get excited about that stuff. I just get excited about that. And you see, you could be sitting here today. Maybe you have an illness today. Maybe you're sitting today. Maybe you're sick today. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're carrying just some problem. Maybe at work. Some of you younger people, maybe at school. Maybe you're sitting here today and there's there just something that nags at your life, something that troubles your life. Listen, maybe you're sitting here today and there's something and you've never shared it with anyone else. That could be your situation today. I want to tell you today, praise God, he knows all about it. He knows all about it. And Jesus heals we believe that Jesus heals. Question will be, of course, in his will. Is that his will for your life? Maybe that difficulty you're in, what's his will for that situation? You young people, maybe that prayer pressure that you're trying to put up with all of the time, what's his will on that situation? 
And sometimes, friends, those things hurt. Sometimes those things cut deep. Sometimes those things disappoint us. They discourage us. Sometimes we look at those things and we think, is there any way out of this? But praise God, he knows it all. Hallelujah. He knows it all. And in the meantime, it takes faith to keep going on in that. But Jesus walks with you in that faith. And you can go on when you see that it's not always going to be that way. Because thank God there's a world that's waiting. Eternity. For those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. No sickness. Amen. No pain. I don't think they'll even be old age there. Do you? Hey, eternally with the Lord. No tears. And we see it by faith. We see it by faith. But you can't have faith without being in proper fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we think of witness in these days of time. As we thought about worship, about the word, and about the will. We think about witness. How we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. Some people say, I would just love to be like Peter. Imagine preaching and 3,000 souls getting saved in one day. Or imagine being like the Charles Finney's who preached and saw a revival practically everywhere he went. And you see, we attribute being filled with the Holy Ghost to accomplish some kind of great thing for Jesus. But friends, let me take you back to Paul again in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says we all need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Even in our ordinary everyday walk and in our ordinary everyday life so that we can stand for him, so that we can speak for him, and so that we can suffer for him if that's what his will determines. The days in which we live, changing days, perilous days, troubled days, But thank God today we have a Savior who by His Spirit equips us for whatever the world wants to throw at us as we keep in tune and as we keep in touch with Him. Do you believe that today? Praise God. Father, Lord, we just commit this solemn message to You. Because, Lord, You look across Your people today and You know where everyone lives their life. You know the places they go, the people they move amongst. Lord, you know the opposition to your kingdom that your people face wherever they go. Lord, today, as we bow in your presence, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you will pour into our lives everything that your people need you to pour in in order that we might be the witnesses you want us to be in these days of time. Lord, help us to put on the whole armor of God. Help us to stand in that evil day. And having done all, to stand. And Lord, may our testimony at all times, may our witness at all times to the lost and those who are antagonistic around us with the claims of Christ, Lord, we pray that our witness at all times might be fruitful and completely in your will for the honor and glory of your name. So, Lord, bless your word to our hearts today. Lord, bless every single person who's bowed in your presence today. Move upon us, Lord. Move upon us, we humbly pray, and meet every need, because we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.